Hello YouTube. So in this video I want to talk about practical reason, in particular the question of whether there are certain ends or aims that are intrinsically irrational. Can there be rational assessment of one's ends? Uh, now clearly we often engage in rational assessment of the means for achieving particular ends. Uh, if I desire a long and healthy life, um, then there are certain actions that will be more or less effective at bringing that about. Tragically, uh, it turns out that gorging on chocolate cake every day is not a particularly effective means for achieving uh, the end of a long and healthy life. Um, and of course, I might make a mistake about this. I might mistakenly believe that um, uh, eating chocolate cake every day uh, is going to, you know, be a better way of maximizing my life expectancy, is, is going to be more likely to maximize my life expectancy than eating vegetables. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, it seems like I can make errors about that. That's Now, that's obviously just a descriptive claim um, about, uh, you know, like what the consequences of particular actions will be, right? So if I gorge on chocolate cake every day, I'm going to increase my risk of diabetes and heart disease and so on. Uh, and so that will frustrate the aim of a long and healthy life. But what about the ends themselves? Can I make, can I be mistaken in the ends I choose? Uh, or can I be irrational in choosing particular ends? Um, so, I mean, my own view actually is, is uh, no, I, 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 I've always had the sense that, um, that one's ends are just outside the scope of rational assessment. As Hume says, uh, it is not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the world to the scratching of my finger. Um, and it is not contrary to reason to prefer my own acknowledged lesser good uh, to my greater good. So somebody who wants to destroy the entire world, uh, I don't think they're making any error. They're not being irrational in any way in adopting that as their end, in, in my view. Now, I think most philosophers... Uh, would disagree with this and would say that no, there are certain ends that are intrinsically irrational. And indeed, the um, the man who aims to destroy the world uh, has a, an irrational end, right? A aiming to destroy the world is irrational. Um, and so there are plenty of other cases that you find in the literature, uh, in metaethics, in you know the literature on well-being and value and so on. Um, that are supposed to illustrate the irrationality of certain ends. Uh, so a famous one is the blade of grass counter. So imagine a man who uh, devotes his life to counting blades of grass. Uh, now, he doesn't get any pleasure from counting blades of grass, and he's not counting blades of grass to achieve any further purpose. Uh, he's not counting blades of grass because, you know, God told him to or anything like that. Uh, he just... He just has this desire to count blades of grass. That is his aim. Um, and actually, uh, we can just stipulate that uh, he finds it incredibly boring and dull and frustrating. Um, he he kind of wishes, uh, perhaps, that he had different aims, but as it happens, no, he is just, uh, you know, driven by this aim to count blades of grass, and that's what he devotes his life to. Uh, even though he gains no benefit from it, uh, doesn't even get any pleasure out of it. Um, this is, uh, he is devoting his life to uh, something which is an intrinsically unvaluable, unworthy cause. Um, and his aim is intrinsically irrational. Uh, similarly, another famous example comes from Derek Parfit of Future Tuesday Indifference. So the man with Future Tuesday Indifference is indifferent to pains that occur on all future Tuesdays. So if you give this man the uh, option, let's say he has to have surgery, uh, and it's going to be a very long surgery, it's like 10 hours, uh, 10 hour long surgery, and you give him the option of having the surgery without anaesthetic on Tuesday, or uh, with anaesthetic on Wednesday, um, he will take the surgery on Tuesday. He will take 10 hours of excruciating agony, um, excruciating suffering over, uh, you know, like a, a mild, a mild pinprick, slight discomfort on Wednesday. Um, and I mean, let's just stipulate as well that um, in, in this, in this, in the world of this thought experiment, there are no risks whatsoever associated with general anaesthetic. So, um, you know, so, so this man recognises 
that, uh, yeah, like once Tuesday comes around, he's going to wish that he chose the surgery on Wednesday instead. Um, like once Tuesday comes around, he's going to experience the pain and he's going to experience it just like the rest of us. He's going to really regret his decision. Um, and he knows that. Um, but even so, because it occurs on a future, like before Tuesday, he's just indifferent to what happens to him on future Tuesdays. So he will take the agony on Tuesday over the mild discomfort on Wednesday. Um, and so, you know, Parpit says, this is just irrational. Um, this is clearly irrational because we have a reason to avoid excruciating agony and there's no particular reason to uh, discount um, what will occur on uh, Tuesdays. You know, like that doesn't make it, it doesn't make any difference whether something happens on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. The distinction there is completely arbitrary. Um, so this, this man's um, aims, his values are intrinsically irrational. So anyway, that's the point of these sorts of examples, is that there are some aims or ends or desires that are irrational. And I mean, you're making an error, right? Like, uh, I guess one way to put this would be in terms of uh, stance independent reasons. So you have a reason uh, not to spend your life counting blades of grass, uh, even if that is currently your aim. Uh, you have a reason to be concerned about what happens to you on future Tuesdays, even if you don't currently care about that. Um, so, okay, so that's, uh, I, again, I think that's that's probably the, the, the common view. I have to say that, you know, my my feeling about a lot of these cases, my, my reaction to a lot of these cases is I find them, you know, puzzling and frustrating because I just, I guess, I just don't get the intuition. Um, so my view, uh, is that there are just no rational constraints on your ends. Um, and in fact, I would say there are no rational constraints on how you go about achieving your ends. Uh, so what is subject to rational assessment, I guess, would be the descriptive claims about the consequences of particular actions. Um, so yeah, I mean, people can make mistakes about that. If I, uh, like I said, you know, if I claim that I, I want to live a long and healthy life, and then I claim that eating chocolate cake every day is the best way of, um, you know, increasing my expected life expect, my, increasing my life expectancy. Well, you know, we can bring lots of evidence to bear um, against that, um, and you know, I'm I'm probably making an error there. I'm probably going to end up with you know diabetes and heart disease and all sorts of things that I actually want to avoid. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm making an error about the facts there. But, you know, when I think about these, these examples um, of people who have very strange motivational structures, I just don't see where the mistake is. I mean, these people are very, they are strange, they are unusual, but, you know, so what? That doesn't seem, I wouldn't say it's irrational to be unusual. Um, so in the case of, you know, Future Tuesday indifference, um, there's a very nice article by uh, Sharon Street, um, which I think it's called In Defense of Future Tuesday Indifference. And she uh, spends quite a bit of time, you know, looking at the details of this case and, you know, drawing distinctions between different kinds of Future Tuesday Indifference. And it's a really great article. I, I, I love it. And she's, uh, you know, she's sort of trying, she, she gives a very sophisticated response, basically. You know, she gives a very sophisticated response, which is, uh, designed to um, show that there's it's actually not so counterintuitive but I have to say that for you know for me there's something it, it would feel sort of dishonest to give that kind of response because my actual reaction to these cases is much more simple it's just you know I read cases like this and I'm just like I just don't get the like what the intuition is here I just don't get it I don't see why I would think that there's anything irrational about this it seems perfectly I mean, I don't necessarily want to say it seems perfectly fine, because again, somebody who has Future Tuesday indifference, I mean, they are, they have a strange motivational structure. And, you know, I can say, well, um, you know, like maybe somebody who has that kind of motivational structure, I would find it difficult to sort of empathize with them, I'd find it difficult to sympathize with them to understand their point of view. But I don't, I don't, even have the intuition that there is anything irrational or that they're making a mistake. Um, 
it, it looks so to me, you know, like there are things that I could say to this person with future Tuesday indifference. But what we're supposed to be stipulating, right? It is stipulated as part of this thought experiment that they are not making any errors about the descriptive facts. So, you know, the person with future Tuesday indifference is well aware that by the time Tuesday rolls around, they're going to regret their decision. So they like they know that then. So when they choose the surgery on Tuesday without anaesthetic, they know that by the time they're having that surgery, they're really going to regret it. You know, they know that they're going to wish they'd chosen to have it on Wednesday instead. They know that they're going to experience excruciating agony. So they're not mistaken about any of the things that are going to occur. Um, they just have uh, a, an attitude of indifference towards them. Um, at least that's their attitude now. Obviously, later, by the time Tuesday comes around, they're going to have a different attitude. Um, doesn't seem to me like there's anything in general problematic about making choices that I will later come to regret. Uh, in fact, I think it's it's quite common. You know, I I, I can't remember where I read this. I, I know there's um, uh, a, a, a nice example um, where it's like, OK, Parfit's case of Future Tuesday indifference sounds really weird. But, you know, we're all maybe uh, familiar with at least a mild kind of future Monday indifference. Um, so plenty of people go back to work on Monday, but maybe they decide to just spend the, um, you know, the, the, the day before, the, the night before uh, uh, they decide to stay awake. Maybe they decide to party, knowing that they're going to regret it on, on Monday. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, again, that's a, a very mild case of this. But the point is, is that we regularly make these decisions that we know we're going to regret. To me, there doesn't seem anything irrational about that. Um, I suppose, you know, so like more generally, why would I take it that my attitude towards pain or suffering in the future? So, you know, my, my attitude, so the attitude that I will, so why should I take it that the attitude I will have towards my suffering on Tuesday is supposed to like trump or outweigh the attitude I have towards it now? Um, I I like I I don't really see you know like I don't see why like <laughs> you know um what like why must I act in a way that uh, you know like my attitudes are sort of consistent over time um I I think that see when I think about like uh there are these sorts of cases of making decisions that um that I know I'm going to regret uh you know, in some time, there, there are even cases where I think it's, it might even be like admirable. Um, so uh, maybe think of something like, you know, an artist uh, who decides to uh, make some sort of incredible sacrifice. There was an artist, uh, I think is, I can't, I'm probably not going to pronounce his name correctly, but it's Paul G G Gorgon or Gogan or something like that. G-A-U-G-I-N, I think. Um, and he uh, decided to... I, I'm probably, I've probably got the wrong artist, actually. But there was some artist who decided to, you know, leave his, his family and, um, like, just abandon his life and uh, sail to, to some island somewhere. And it seems like uh, a person could make that decision knowing that they're going to regret it. You know, they could say, I'm going to sacrifice everything I have for the sake of pursuing art. And I know I'm going to regret this in the future. I know in the future I'm going to... I'm going to wish that I, you know, re like retained all of my wealth and my material possessions. But even so, um, I choose to do this. This is like I am like screw my future self. Uh, I don't care about him. Screw him. I'm going to uh, act on my values now. OK, <laughs> like, uh, you know, that seems fine to me. So. I mean, again, this isn't a particularly sophisticated response, but it is the honest response. With something like, you know, the uh, the blade of grass counter, the interesting thing about the man who spends his life counting blades of grass is that that actually strikes me as being very similar to my actual situation. You know, with the man with Future Tuesday indifference, I feel that I... I, I struggle to see things from his perspective in a sense, like he seems very strange to me. Um, but the man who spends his life counting blades of grass, I'm like, yeah, that that's very similar to what I do. Um, because I spend my life doing uh, things like philosophy. And, um, you, you know, it's not clear to me that I really get... So first of all, it's not clear to me that I get any 
significant pleasure out of it. I mean, I'm not sure it really makes me happy. Like, so doing this video, for instance, uh, I don't know if, you know, like, reading philosophy, writing philosophy, recording videos like this makes me happy. There's actually a great deal of frustration and boredom involved. Um, so, you know, like, when I, when, when I do philosophy, I'm aiming to achieve some specific thing. Maybe I'm aiming to create a video. Um, or maybe I'm aiming to write an essay. But the process of doing that isn't particularly pleasurable. Like, this right now is not particularly pleasurable. In fact, I would say that this is kind of uncomfortable. Um, the reason why this is uncomfortable is that I often feel uncomfortable talking off the top of my head. And so, you know, I have, I've made like a few notes for this, but this is basically off the top of my head. Um, so, and I, I feel uncomfortable doing that. Uh, similarly, when I do the videos that are scripted, I mean, writing those scripts take eight, takes ages. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's really frustrating, actually, uh, the amount of time it takes. And it's not particularly interesting. Uh, often reading philosophy is, uh, is frustrating and boring. There are things I don't get. So, okay, there's a lot of frustration. And moreover, I know that once I have created the video or written the essay, I'm not actually going to get much pleasure out of it. So once this video is done, uh, I, I'll have, I don't know, like a minute of pleasure. Um, you know, I'll feel happy with myself for like a minute, but then I just, that dissipates and I move on to something else. Um, so, okay, I'm not really getting much pleasure. Uh, am I doing this then because, uh, so like, why am I doing this? I mean, I'm not doing it for any further purpose. It's not like I'm, I'm not, I'm not really doing this, uh, because I think it's going to help set me up for some career that I'm, uh, that I'm looking for. You know, somebody might make sacrifices now and they might uh, spend their time studying a particular topic because they desire a career that they think will bring them a lot of pleasure. Obviously, I'm not doing that. Philosophy, for me, is the end in itself. I'm, like, this philosophy, learning philosophy, communicating philosophy, that is just the end in itself. There is no further reason for it. I'm just doing for it, it for its own sake. Um, but like, okay, what, like, why is that valuable? Am I going to say that maybe there's some value in having, you know, in just having knowledge? Um, I mean, maybe that's my view. I'm not really sure. I don't really think about it uh, very carefully. Of course, the standard view would probably be that, yes, you know, knowledge is, uh, is something that makes a person's life go well. Um, that's on the, uh, the objective list of goods. If you have uh, knowledge that promotes your well-being. Um, but I don't, I mean, personally, I don't really uh, feel that way. Um, I don't quite understand why I do philosophy. I find myself sort of just driven by a desire that is beyond, you know, beyond my understanding. And um, so in many ways, I, I, fe I feel like I can sympathise with the person who spends their life counting blades of grass. That makes a lot of sense to me, actually. Like, it, it's, it doesn't seem different in kind to what I do in my own life. Um, so, I don't know, maybe I'm... Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe uh, the reason why I don't find these, uh, these cases irrational is that uh, I myself am... Um, uh, um, irrational in just these ways. Uh, but anyway, the point is, yeah, you know, the, the blade of grass counter, again, I just don't have the intuition that anything irrational is going on there. So um, one thing that you tend to find then, uh, even among people who sort of share the kind of anti-realist sort of view of value and reasons that I have, um, is a lot of people will still want to say there's some sort of you know, constraint of instrumental rationality. So, you know, if you want to achieve X, then you ought to do Y. Um, so you, you ought to uh, do the, what will bring about um, your ends. So the thought is that, um, okay, maybe there is no place for the, uh, 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 maybe there's no end that is irrational, but, you can still be making, or it can still be, you can still be irrational in your means for achieving the end. Um, so you, you ought to do what will satisfy your ends, and if you're failing to do what will satisfy your ends, then that's irrational. Um, but actually, 
I don't think I agree even with that. Uh, so why so like why is it the case that I rationally ought to do what will satisfy my ends? Um, I mean, you know, here, so here's one thought about this. We might say, well, look, people just will take the means to satisfy their ends by definition, right? So if I desire X and I recognize that Y is a means of achieving X, then, uh, and, and Y doesn't conflict with my other desires, then I just will do Y. Um, that's like what it is to have a desire. Um, so we might say that somebody who fails to act in accordance with this kind of instrumental rationality is, uh, th this person just doesn't really even have the relevant desire. So like if I claim to desire X and then I'm just not acting on what I take to be an effective means of achieving X, um, then actually I don't desire X. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's one view I suppose you could take. Uh, if that's true, then that would just be a piece of descriptive psychology. I mean, it, it wouldn't, um, it, I don't think it would tell us anything about, you know, uh, what the sort of rational constraints on, uh, on actions are. Um, and as it happens, I think that that's probably, um, probably not a, a particularly useful way of thinking about desires. So it seems to me that, you know, yeah, there are, there are many things that I might say I desire, but that uh, I really take no effort whatsoever to achieve. I mean, in so, so I would say, yeah, like I desire to uh, have uh, a million pounds, but I'm not really doing anything to achieve the uh, the end of gaining a million pounds. Or I desire uh, world peace. I desire an end to war, but I'm not doing anything to try to bring about an end to war. Um, I, you know, that, <laughs> that seems fine. And indeed, there are even cases where I may act uh, contrary to my state of desires. I may prefer, well, as Hume said, you know, I may prefer my um, acknowledged lesser good over my greater good. I think that's actually probably quite common, you know. Uh, so on the so I, I have a general desire to be healthy, and that's like a desire which I take to be pretty fundamental. Like one of my basic drives is to live a long and healthy life. Uh, at the same time, I also want to eat lots of chocolate cake, and so I regularly uh my my diet is such that i'm not really um going to you know maximize my life expectancy so i'm i'm kind i'm like i'm like on the one hand my desire for a long and healthy life does constrain my diet in some ways you know because i'm not constantly gorging on chocolate cake but i very often fall into temptation and i think this is a pretty common thing right so uh is this is this irrational? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I don't see why it would be. It seems to me, again, like I, we, can, we can have an argument about the descriptive facts. So it's like we can debate what sort of diet would be the best way of achieving a long and healthy life. But, you know, once I've said, OK, um, I want to have a long and healthy life, um, but I also just want to eat this chocolate cake and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to do that. I, I recognise that it's not... Uh, that it's not healthy, but I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, okay. Well, what more is there? You know, what more is there to be said? Um, there's um, <clears throat> there's a really nice article by uh, Luke Bovins um, called "The Two Faces of Acratics Anonymous." It's one of my favourite articles ever written uh, in philosophy. It's a very short article. It's only about five pages. I strongly recommend it. Uh, I, I very rarely see people talk about this article. I think it is ingenious. Um, and anyway, he talks about these two approaches to acrasia. So acrasia being weakness of the will. Um, and, you know, he says that, <clears throat> look, there's like two strategies for dealing with acrasia. Philosophers have mainly focused on the first strategy. So the first strategy is to increase the costs of the acratic action. Um, so I have this desire to eat chocolate cake, right? But I can increase the costs of that. I can increase the costs of that. I can increase the cost of eating chocolate cake so that I'm no longer tempted to eat it. So one way to increase the cost would be to just tell everyone that I'm pursuing a healthy diet. And that way, uh, you know, if, I, if everybody knows that I 
that I have stated I'm not going to be eating loads of chocolate cake, then when I do eat chocolate cake, I'm going to feel some sort of guilt about that. Uh, you know, <laughs> like, um, uh, when it, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to want somebody to see me eating chocolate cake, otherwise I've like broken a promise or something like that. So, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can structure your environment in such a way that the action becomes like in, has increased disutility. And so that will allow you to resist the temptation. Um, the second option though, uh, is to raise the utility of the Akratic action so that it no longer counts as Akratic to perform the action. Um, so one thing you can do is, um, you know, modify your self-conception, for instance. Uh, you might try to, you might say, well, I want to be the kind of person who is sort of wild and bohemian and spontaneous. Um, you know, the kind of person who just doesn't, doesn't really care about, uh, you know, <laughs> like, uh, it isn't really sort of focused on, on future goods, but who like lives in the moment, you know, so you can have a self-conception of, uh, of, of being somebody, yeah, who, who has this sort of bohemian lifestyle. And that way, when you eat chocolate cake, well, yeah, eating chocolate cake is not going it is not going to promote the end of living a long and healthy life. Um, but look, it is going to be the sort of thing that this wild bohemian hedonist would do. Um, s s similarly, you know, but Bovin says you can try to find certain lifestyles where the Akratic action has greater utility. So maybe um, somebody who's very greedy could, uh, instead of trying to combat their greed, they could just become, you know, hedge fund manager or something. And uh, then greediness becomes a virtue. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's interesting. But then, it, you know, it occurs to me there's also this third strategy, which is the strategy actually that I like the most. Uh, Bovins doesn't talk about this, but it's the strategy that I use, which is just to not care about it is just to say, okay, so I'm sometimes going to be falling into temptation. I'm sometimes going to perform acratic actions. So what? That's just part of the richness of life. I'm just going to take it that a crazier is, uh, is all part of fun. So, um, you know, like, uh, okay. Um, you know, so, so you can, you can increase the cost of the acratic action to prevent temptation. You can, uh, increase the utility of the Akratic action so that it's no longer Akratic, um, or you can just not care. Uh, you can just not care about uh, falling into temptation. <laughs> and I don't see any of the, so it seems to me that all of these strategies are, like, they seem equally rational. I mean, they, in fact, they all seem to just be outside the scope of rational assessment. I don't see where the error is, where the mistake is. Um, Again, as long as you're describing them correctly, I mean, you like, you know, you you can you can make mistakes about what the facts are, but or about like um, what the consequences of your actions will be. But as long as you've got it, as long as you've got those facts right, that just seems like that that's it. There's nothing more to be said. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I take it that um, there are no. Uh, there's no rational constraint on what your ends might be. There's no rational constraint on the means of achieving your ends. Um, I don't think there's anything problematic about having completely inconsistent or mutually incompatible ends. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, if I have uh, incompatible ends, then uh, uh, it will be impossible to satisfy all of them. I mean, just by definition, but, you know, I mean... So what? Uh, that can actually be kind of admirable, I think, having ends that are impossible to satisfy. Like, you know, somebody who aims for world peace probably recognises that that is, at least in practice, impossible to satisfy. Um, but, you know, like just devoting themselves to um, this end that they know will fail to be achieved, but just doing it anyway, that's kind of admirable. And so if that's admirable, like how admirable will it be to have, you know, two ends that are logically inconsistent you know there is no possible world in which these ends can be achieved um and then just committing <laughs> committing to both of them anyway i mean actually uh, i think like having you know inconsistent ends um uh, look i mean just like with a crazier uh you have some people who like to be 
strict and uh, and monkish. Uh, and then you have the people who like to be wild and bohemian. Well, you know, the kind of wild bohemian person, maybe it makes sense for them to adopt inconsistent ends. Um, if I have uh, if I have sort of inconsistent ends, then maybe that gives my life a kind of spontaneity. Maybe it gives me some sense of sort of f freedom, right? Like my actions are going to be somehow unpredictable, even even to myself, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, because in any particular. So like, you know, sometimes I'm going to follow one end, sometimes I'm going to follow another end. And I, like even I might not be able to predict which one I'm, I'm going to adopt. Um, uh, it's maybe a, a, a way of like exploring different values of uh, engaging in the sort of million experiments in living, um, but embodied in a single person, you know. Um, I can even imagine a person who like rebels against their own ends or desires, a person who just explicitly, so like a person who has desires and then decides, so like takes it that the fact that they have a desire is a reason not to do that thing. So the fact that I have a desire to eat chocolate cake is a reason not to eat chocolate cake, or the fact that I desire a long and healthy life is a reason not to pursue a long and healthy life, is a reason to take loads of risks. Um, so like a person who rebels against themselves, um, I could take it as my project to act against my own desires, um, where I just don't even have any further reasons for doing that. It's That's just like a basic project of mine. Uh, yeah, why not? Um, <laughs> I mean, again, this is a very strange, that's a very strange sort of person, a person who's like at war with themselves. But it's also a person who I think might be kind of interesting, um, might be kind of uh, fascinating. Uh, and certainly I don't see where the irrationality is. Um, so anyway, uh, I suppose, you know, what's the, what's the point of all of this? How long have I been talking for? My goodness, half an hour. That's been me talking for half an hour and really not saying much, right? So um, the point of <laughs> the point of all of this, I could have probably said this in about three minutes, is that you know there's all of these cases that philosophers like to give of um, people who have supposedly uh, intuitively irrational ends, and I just don't get it. I don't I don't get the intuition. It doesn't seem to me like they're doing anything irrational, and in fact, in in many cases. A lot of these characters, I find them, some of them, like the Blade of Grass counter, I actually have, I find them very understandable and I feel like we have something in common in a very deep level. Like I, 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 I feel that person, like that person, I, you know, the Blade of Grass counter, I, like he's, yeah, he's my brother, you know, I really can feel a, a sense of like a resonance with that guy. Um, other other examples of these um, supposedly irrational people, uh, maybe I don't quite understand them, but they seem interesting, and in a way, it seems it would be kind of worthwhile to have people like that. Um, to people who it's it's worthwhile. It's all part of you know the variety of existence. Having people who you know discount uh, uh, their uh, their future, their future goods um, and future costs. Um, having people who have inconsistent ends. Um, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, so I just, uh, I just don't, I don't get the intuition. That's my, that's my response. That's my honest response to a lot of these cases. It's very simple, very straightforward. I just don't share the intuition. <clears throat> and I'm going to leave it there. <laughs>